Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Dustin from Revere Glass. If you've been a long time viewer, thank you so much for your continued support. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Today, we're inviting back Pyro, who's an amazing artist who joined us really early on for Penetration Sherlock. Now he's developed that, they're called Pylox. Super cool to see, really awesome to have him back. And we're working on a piece that took days and it was amazing experience to make. You guys will check it out. I mean, this is definitely the most complicated piece that we've ever put up on one of these on the torch videos. So there's a lot of it that we had to cut out to fit it in. We did make it in two parts. So please make sure you check out the second part and yeah, we'll get into the studio and check it out. But before we get in there, I just wanted to thank our sponsor, Mountain Glass Arts. They do an amazing job supplying the entire industry. They're really the leading supplier. They have such a variety of stuff. They're an eco-friendly company. I mean, I really can't say enough. I mean. These are things that I'm all saying from the heart. Like you guys, they're an amazing company. I've worked with them for years. They are a big reason why Glassblowing is so accessible. So thanks Mountain Glass Arts. And you guys should check it out when you want to get into Glassblowing. Make sure you tell them that you saw this in a video and I think they'll give you a little discount on your first order. Make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video because we're gonna be giving away this amazing necklace that Diane, the Queen of Green and I made together. I love it. It's so, so beautiful with these pastel colors. So make sure you stay to the end of the video to see if you've won that. This week, we're also gonna be giving away another pair of diamond shears from Mountain Glass Arts. We're also gonna be giving away this marble that Pyro made. Yeah, we really wanted to thank him for coming and give you guys something that Pyro made as well. So thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for checking this out. Make sure you stay to the end. Thank you Pyro so much. Check out his Instagram, Sir Pyro Glass. We'll see you in the shop. All right, dude, super stoked to have Pyro in the studio again and uh, his apprentice Lee. It was, it was such an honor and um, dude, we had so much fun. Thank you so much for coming. Great times, man, let's be there. All right, so the first thing that um, I'm gonna do here is Pyro brought some line tubing that he, he made and it's it's actually, we kind of work in like a similar style of line tubing. So this is stuff that Pyro pulled at, at his shop and I'm just gonna make up some wigwags here um, for, for the construction of this piece. So, I mean, you guys have seen tons of wigwags along the way and of course there's videos specifically about it. Um, do you remember when you first started doing wigwags, Pro? Oh gosh, man. Um, probably somewhere around 2002, 2000, 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. Nice. Did you have, um, did you like kind of come up with it from messing around with stuff or did you have someone helping you? Um, I, at that point, you know, out there. Uh, other people's work and was kind of emulating existing work. Yeah. So I kind of just uh, kind of figured it out from looking at it. I was like, oh, looks like they just zigzag that back and forth and the axis. And there you go. What year did you start blowing glass? Uh, I guess the end of 98. 98. Yeah. I usually say 99 because that's really like where I started, but I guess 98 was really when it started do you remember like what was happening and you know like what got you into it i uh my brother had met darby in uh to mm -hmm. or and uh you know he took me out there to see his uh his shop and check it out and so i'm working in his bus in his driveway and I, you know, at the time wanted to go to culinary school and become a chef, and I fell in love with glass blowing that day. It was like, that is the coolest thing. I think that's what I want to do. I think that there's like some some overlap with um, cooking and glass blowing because it's all about like timing and heat and heat distribution. Um, you know, in the little details, like I love to cook as well. And so I often think about like the correlation between cooking and glass blind. Yeah, they definitely have some, uh, some close crossovers as far as uh, creative input and, you know, the use of heat and uh, timing, like you said. So I, I'm, I'm just making um, some reticello prep here. And this is again, some line tubing that Pyro brought over. And it looks like it's got some heavy blue stardust in it maybe um yeah at uh, that point that tubing it's a uh, 
rainbow heavy blue stardust uh, ready tubing the yeah. one. And so, of course, there's a couple other videos on Reticello's where we're going to go into it in more depth. There's there was so much work that went into this piece. We really had to um, make it even even getting it into two parts um, was a challenge. I mean, I think there was about what are you, three, four days of work on this piece, Pyro, something like that. Uh, yeah, it, was, it, it almost ended up being about four days. In the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and those were long days, guys. So we, we shortened it down to about. Uh, two episodes for you um and we got we got definitely the meat of it uh there may be some more content on the online school if you want to check that out at revereglass.com i may put up some un unedited raw footage of it or something so i'm just uh inserting that i mean that's the way i like to do reticello there's so many different ways so i just made a sleeve and dropped it in and then evacuated the air and now you can see that they're they're stuck together and lines going in opposite directions is that the way you do a pyro or you do a different technique? Uh, I mean, pretty much the same exact way. Yeah. I, a little bit thinner mm -hmm. as far as the walls. But I mean, as long as the two tubes are the same thickness, same spin, it pretty much all works out the same. Yeah. So I'm just doing a little bit of the prep of the wigwags here, cutting these into sections. If you really want to be exact, you guys, you can cut these up on the saw and weigh them out. And if you if you actually weigh out your your line tubing, you'll be able to make exactly the same wigwags. If that's important in the particular piece that you're making, I, man, that level of meticulousness that <laughs> sometimes is necessary, but I rarely go to the end of. Yeah, totally, totally. It's good to know that those things exist, you know, and they're out there. But yep. um, no, that's great. Yeah eyeballing it can only get you so close exactly i mean and it, it's nice and i mean it depends your workflow and kind of what you're up to uh, i'm just kicking it back and forth here you know making my wigs and my wags twisting one direction letting it cool a little bit then twisting the other and kind of condensing it back up what what where do you find your inspiration pyro like i like i know hanging out we've hung out a few times now and like you've you you've gone on some like really interesting adventures that you've told me about and i know that we have like uh a lot of overlap in some of the things that we do outside of uh the glass world too so i mean where, where do you like to find your inspiration and and like the other the other parts of passion that come into your life oh man definitely other mediums of art as well as music uh definitely that create space uh i'm frequently inspired by any number of things but you know the other day i was i thought i saw a plastic halloween decoration sitting on my table that was like a you know a skeleton uh octopus head uh -huh. like a almost like a cthulhu character and i was uh -huh. like oh really cool out of glass yeah Shit, you know, so I, inspiration comes from any number of places, but it's uh, for some of this stuff, this this piece that we were working on here, kind of the evolution of a, a piece that I made in 2004, probably, uh, that was a bubbler with a carb on it, you know, with a big can on top. And, all the three donuts and everything like that, but it didn't recycle or have any of the the fun. Uh, this and so these uh, trypto cyclers are basically the evolution of you know twenty years of glass blowing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's actually super cool <clears throat> um, if you look at the progression of your work, and you know, just like for those of you guys who have been like longtime viewers, you know that this is Pyro's second time back for uh, on the torch video and his first video was awesome it's it's one of the most popular ones and uh it, at the time i think it was called a penetration sherlock but now it's called a pylock um, yeah. um and you can see that 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 piece had some of the foundation of what this piece is that that you constructed this time right yeah, definitely well they're they're both rooted back in 
the, the same time period for me. It was, you know, it was a, they were back when I made them originally stylistically, the forms uh, were super, super challenging for me. And I, it was a huge hurdle to just have made the one or two pieces that I made. And I never really went back to it. And I uh, just constantly experimented and drove and, you know, did production for years. So I constantly was honing in my skills, but um, yeah, developing the the pylock itself and then evolving it, the Trypto Cycler. <clears throat> like I said, they're both actually designs that I basically kind of came up with back in 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. but they kind of got shelved because I wasn't good enough yet. Like I just, and they were okay, but you know, now I feel confident to make these pieces um, in a way you know, represents the, the time and effort that goes into them well. Yeah, I think that's like kind of a good point for people who are watching this. And for those of you guys kind of more at the beginning of your career is that you should document all of your ideas in a journal and you, you, those, those will be gold later on once oh, you, <laughs> once you can find your technique and you're, you're able to really make whatever's in your imagination, you can look back on your ideas and be like, oh yeah, I could actually do that now. Let me, yeah. let me see what that's going to look like. Holy. Yeah. So we're just push, putting our work together. Pyro is doing a, that's um, a carmeline piece that I blew out that then Pyro sleeved and thinned it out and, and brought that down, which looked beautiful. And I'm just pulling together some wigwags here. And we're going to put all this stuff together and make this incredible piece. I'm sure you guys saw it in the thumbnail or whatever, but um, it's quite an amazing, you know, I'm, I want to give a lot of credit to Pyro's ability as a glass blower and design. Like, the, you know, this is a pretty cool piece. It's one of the coolest ones I've been involved with. So that's that's definitely an honor. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of inspiration from different artists and uh, really soft glass as a medium. Yep. Kind of, a lot of the techniques that I am drawing on are from you know, classical soft glass and then bringing into scientific laboratory function and yep. turning that we smoke weed out of. <laughs> yeah, totally. I feel like that soft glass background for me also played a major role. Like, especially like, you know, I was probably one of the earliest pipe makers using soft glass tools like jacks and diamond shears and shit like that because I had this soft glass experience. And now it's pretty widely accepted. But uh, e even 10 years ago, um, I remember most people still didn't, you know, have, have like jacks on their bench or whatever, you know, now everyone's got the tiny little jacks. Even I didn't. Yeah. I, my tweezer jacks are my number one go-to tool for the last six years. And, uh, I, 10 years ago, I didn't even, I wouldn't even have had jacks on my bench because exactly. it just, like, oh, I've got graphite. Why, why do I right. need jack? doesn't, you know, it, it the glass works differently. We've got different temperature and timing and stuff like that. And yeah. so when it comes down to it, you know, the jacks that we use in soft glass don't necessarily work as well on Boro. Right. The way we work Boro as we're working at such a high temperature and leaving our tools in there. But then you realize like, well, that's because when you're a noob and you're working with metal tools and you're overheating your tools and you're overheating your you realize that you know you're you're damaging your tools and you're you're leaving marks on your glass and you're like oh well uh, that tool doesn't work for me and it, maybe it's not necessarily the tool but the inexperience of this yeah. our first uh, trying to figure those things out so graphite tends to be a little more forgiving mm. when, you know, uh, especially when you're inexperienced mm, it's kind of an interesting point yes yeah, that's, that's a, there's a lot to think about there um yeah. Well, yeah, you guys, I don't know if you, you know, some of you guys do. I helped design a pair of jacks um, for pipe making. Um, they're, for, they're from uh, Roberto Dona. Uh, you can get them at Spiral Arts if they're in stock. I don't get anything from it. I mean, my name's on the tool, which is credit enough, but I'm not trying to like sell it to you guys. But I did make these jacks specifically for pipe making. And they're a little different than the tweezer jacks that a lot of people use. I really like them. They're tiny. There they are in my hand right there. So um, they're really, I, I have to say, I prefer them to the tweezer jacks that I have. Oh, thanks. 
Yeah. A little bit different. I'm mean, slightly different way to hold them and use them. So, you know, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, yeah, dude. So that looks great. So you sleeve that twice now? Is that what I see going on? Or is that one time sleeving? Um, I'm pretty sure I just sleeved it once. For those of you guys, there's a lot of technique and stuff. And I know that, um, you, you know, the season three of On the Torch has kind of evolved into where this is more of a, um, uh, a demonstration, uh, what we're doing on the torch these days, because there's so much information here. If you want some more like dense teaching stuff, go ahead and go to revereglass.com because we kind of slow everything down and we go over each of these little components, you know, whether they're with this particular video or anything else out there, um, we really break everything down um, in more detail. So if you guys are, you know, seriously interested in learning some techniques, go ahead and go there. There's a free trial for you to check out what the content is. Yeah, so I think at this point, just uh, shaping down uh, sections of that carmeline tubing to get to the sizes that we need for all the different parts. Yeah, I mean, and uh, for those of you guys that are kind of new or not like deeply following the the color trends or whatever, carmeline right now is a uh, it's, a, it's a super popular color. I mean, I think it's still pretty hard to get. Um, it was a North Star color, and they're they're sold in slugger bars, which are very similar to how soft glass color is sold. They're much thicker. You have to break these down. Um, but just the fact that we can get this like amazing transparent purple pink color is is like totally amazing for somebody who's been in the industry as long as Pyro and I have. Like seeing this color is just like wow. Oh right. When we started, there were so few colors. It was it was dismal. Yeah. And they the uh, it, it soft glass shop the mix of all the moretti and all the oh. 94 and 104 and you're like yeah. oh well but can i get that color and no that does, that color doesn't come in your your yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and i would go and people would be like why aren't you just using soft glass there's all these colors and all these <laughs> choices i'm like i just i can't make the vessels that i want to make with the soft glass the That's same way do what i want it to yeah <laughs> I mean, and, and especially like when I was living in Italy, like they were just like, some of these masters were just teasing me about using borosilicate. They're like, it's like chewing gum and so stiff. And what are you doing? And I'm like, I, I, there's potential here, guys. I, I know it. I see it. Yeah. I think that that stiffness gives us a certain yeah. work and, uh, ability to get some certain definition that's really challenging to get in soft glass and there's actually a couple artists out there that i'm seeing pulling some of our uh, close to our techniques in soft glass yeah. and it's really amazing to see and you're yeah. like well, that is phenomenal be able to pull some of the refined techniques that we're doing with borosilicate yeah and plus the crossover like that i hats off yeah, it's it's pretty cool when 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 you see that the pipe shaping and styling influences other mediums. I've seen that with some woodworking and some painting as well, where it's like clearly influenced by pipe culture, which is is really cool to see how much this is all grown. Yeah, well, I I mean it, it's the the pattern work and techniques that we that we've developed through having this slightly stiffer glass has really uh evolved into just its own medium really and it's awesome yeah and the other point about that being stiffer that's really critical to like the development of pipe making style glass blowing is the uh resistance to thermal shock that resistance to thermal shock compared to like soft glass really makes it possible for us to make complex sculptural pieces by heating up only a small area at a time, making sure that the rest of the piece was properly heated, of course, ahead of time. But you could never do that with soft glass, like point heat like that. You, <coughs> you really have to keep the whole thing hot in soft glass. Right. Uh, there's no uh, heat down. I mean, there are, but not in the sense the to the to the way that we have, where you can table cool things and yeah. go right back that way. 
Uh, yeah, or or even even if we want to put something in the kiln, complicated, and then attach a component and just heat up that one area outside of the kiln, that would still be dangerous uh, in a soft glass structure. You know, you'd have to keep right. everything kind of hot. I'm thinking about building a furnace. Did I tell you that when you were here? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. cool. I'm thinking about um, just like a small one. You know, something just to mess around with. You know, and have some soft glass, you know, bench style stuff. And yeah, I've thought about that. So we yeah, can... I've been wanting to build one out in the desert and uh, get some raw sand and uh, some soda lime, you know, mixture yeah. to uh, cut into beer bottles and do some recycled glass, uh, you know, art gift for, for out there in the desert. Do you want? Do you do you feel like you have uh, space to tell people about East Jesus? That's a pretty interesting adventure. Oh man, that was a that was a fun adventure, and it's an amazing uh, experience in my life. Uh, East Jesus is a, an off grid artist community that I got involved with, uh, building an art car and going to Burning Man. Uh, it was a you know teenage dream, and uh, I did it and then needed somewhere to park it uh, not too long after that and, and uh, a friend of mine introduced me to East Jesus and it's this uh, basically a, you know a, a year round artist community uh, where artists go out there and contribute and donate their time to create uh you know, just uh, all, all forms and mediums of uh, of art from the refuse of society's remnant, so to speak. So it's like uh, living in a in a trash art museum, literally. Yeah. It, uh, so yeah, there's just uh, there's amazing scrap metal art and scrap wood art and structures built out of you know uh, found objects and tra trailers and. We built out a glass studio out there with the uh, solar array and everything operating that the community's built up over the years. And so I contributed some electrical work and did a bunch of different things out there to build up and teach people how to blow glass and so had a kiln running on solar power out there last year or two, just before uh, 2020. Oh, wow. What, how much solar... Um, did it take to run the kiln? How how big of a kiln was it? You know, uh, so I had a little uh, Paragon Bluebird, uh huh, uh huh, um, and the, the XL. Yep. So run that for uh, eight hours a day uh, without uh, into a battery. In this so basically, as long as I turned off the kiln, like I turned it on after ten a.m. and I turned it off. Uh, before 6 p.m., and then, uh, and this is during the winter, mm -hmm. I uh, was able to run the kiln for about eight hours a day without having uh, any issues with uh, with our battery storage. So we were getting a full charge on our batteries every day, and I was still able to run the kiln all day. Wow, wow. How much wattage were you using? Do you remember? Um, not off the top of my head, uh, we're, our, our base... Uh, usage uh, was around 600 all night. Mm -hmm. So with the kiln running on that, you know, we added another 1,200. Pretty sure. So mm -hmm. it you had a few panels. You had a few solar panels. Oh yeah, there was a, there was a, a 150 panel array put there with the uh, what is it? Uh, there was 24 deep cycle batteries creating a 48 volt system that we broke down into uh, uh, one from 12 volt back into uh, you know 125 and ran it was kind of hilarious how we're, when you think about it we're breaking it down we're running solar into batteries to turn it into standard household electricity to yeah. break it plug in our cell phones and our, our, our all our devices that are 12 volt in the first place uh, but we uh, you know we're running a refrigeration and heating and conditioning and stuff like that for for different uh you know for maintaining certain spaces that's cool it sounds like a pretty big i mean 150 panels is a pretty big array 
Yeah, the, it was the the entire roof structure of the the front, uh, air. Yeah. So you're working on the can here. Uh, this is the bottom part of the can, I think, right? Yeah, it looks like I'm building the base. And so we have the that carmeline on either side, and then the wigwags, and then the uh, the uh, radicello uh, in the center. And I, I think this combination is super, like, I don't know, lovely, I guess would be the right word for me. Like, I like, like, the pastel -y colors and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it came together well. The ghost and the carmeline really complement each other. It gives a, a light contrast, but just that that translucency that allows the function really well while still giving a, a dense color. And so like the ghost that that terminology is is being used right now for sleeving colors multiple times and clear. Uh yeah, that and the the white is actually Ghost. Oh, oh, right, right. That's true. That white color is like ghost white, right? That's the, the, another newer North Star color. Yeah, totally. It goes, it goes super well with like that kind of same uh, semi-translucentness of the carmeline, huh? Exactly. Yeah, they both have that almost uh, that uh, you know, where you know, when you water it down enough, you get a really good translucency. Yeah. Look at that. That's 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 not easy to do, you guys. Just so you know, like when you're pulling down a color like this into those thin tubings. I mean, adding the clear definitely like it's going to make it a little bit easier for you guys, but it's still really hard sometimes to pull colored small tubing like that without bumps. So, you know, that's definitely really cool to see somebody be able to do that. You know, it just takes practice. You guys could do that too. Yeah, right. It definitely it's, uh, it's a challenge but getting the getting those walls and the just right on uh, on the entire tube before pulling those tubes down really clutch yeah you take the time to to let everything even out and, and get your heat base nice and equalized and your wall thickness nice and equalized throughout the whole and the, like this is a uh, i've seen different people approach this in, in different ways like i actually tend to work kind of like pyro is working where i'm i'm more extruding from one side to the other and kind of pulling out the size tubing that i want a lot of people or some other people they'll they'll heat up the whole ball and then pull that in one long sh one one shot whereas you know when i pull marinis and other things tubing down i kind of just pull off the end which is how pyro was doing it as well in this video yeah if i'm trying to pull like 12 inch plus pieces of the same size of like a 12 to 15 16 millimeter tube i'm gonna take a big stock of like 50 or 60 mil and pull from the center mm -hmm. have a knuckle on either side and have like a long skinny pull in the middle and cut out that chunk of mm -hmm. just if you want but for these smaller you know six or eight inch pieces that i'm pulling that i need specific sizes of 10 to 12 mil tubing it's a little bit easier to pull it out off the one side just down to that controlled size that you want so uh what are you what are you doing here with this um reticello ball um looks like i'm opening up the end there to flip the axis and put it into a, a section and uh, in the center of uh, the top drain can, what will later be the the top. And do you know how many components went into this piece all together? Like, do you have any idea how many little sections there were? You no, know, I should have like counted that before we talked about this. But I, I would uh, I would venture a guess uh, if you're not including the layered sections, and we're just talking about how many parts had to be broken down and reset yeah. together to assemble it yeah somewhere around you know 30 some pieces yeah i was thinking like 30 to 50 i didn't yeah. count it either but sometimes i like to do that too with my pieces is just like you know find out how many little sections or you know that that, I, that it took to build everything together oh yeah we got two camera angles up here now so this is kind of like what it's like for some of the workshops at revereglass.com um, is that we get multiple cameras going and so we started to do this a little bit on the torch video so you guys could see this way you can see both 
kind of a close-up of what's happening in the flame and what Pyro's hands are doing, which are like both key elements to, you know, how to learn to blow glass. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep it balanced in there and build up that, uh, that bubble using one side as the solid stable form and bringing the other side hot into it and keeping the, the size consistent to where I want. Kind of similar to the way you would with a marble, only, you know, hollow instead of uh, shaping the outside, you're forming it from the inside with pressure. And then there's a wigwag there on the end, and we're gonna blow that out and kind of. You guys it really are through it, yeah. Like you had to condense it through. It's a, uh, yeah. It's a. Uh, we got the wigwag dropped right on top of the ball there, and uh, so I basically. It looks like that's a carmeline section at this point. Yep. And I'm uh, opening up the. I'm putting a lippy there before a uh, little lip wrap before going in to do uh, to add that reticello section into the center which uh, at this point I think will be the the center of the top drain can one of the comments that people give me a, a lot about the previous video that you did uh, with me was that the way that you did the lip wraps on that original Sherlock was mm -hmm. what I think a lot, a lot of people use that technique in the industry because I get that, that feedback. Like, oh, I never thought that, that dude taught me how to make lip wraps and right. I, you were blowing out, you were blowing them out basically. You remember that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I still do that from time to time. Um, but I just, uh, I kind of sw switch back and forth. It really depends on what I'm doing on the piece and like what I'm feeling. Um, with this particular piece, I didn't feel the necessity to do that because uh, I had kind of the consistency that I wanted throughout the whole piece where I knew uh, about where I could add my lip wraps in and get exactly what I wanted out of it versus with that pylog piece, I was doing a lot of little encomos that I wanted to come out with the same size, but uh, gapping on either side of that uh, that UV uh, line as well. So in order to get all of those to come out super crisp in all the different angles, I, I chose to go with that, that's that kind of stamp and cap techniques mm -hmm. or technique that I was uh, using in the original uh, Pylock video. And yeah, it's a, uh, it's funny. I actually, I, I laughed to myself when I was doing this. I was like, I know people are going to point that out. <laughs> yeah. They <Yeah. laughs> yeah, will not doing that the way that he did on the last video i wonder if he still does that i definitely do i think um, it's important yeah. to, to um to have different pathways to the same solution right i mean i think that's one of the beautiful things about glass boring and in the work that that we do with sharing different people's techniques it's like there's so many pathways to uh, a solution and and to know these different avenues just adds a bunch of tools in your toolbox so like pyro said it's like he's feeling it this way, he knows how to do it. If he's feeling it the other way, he knows how to do it that way too. Yeah, it really all depends on what I'm going for at the time and if I feel the necessity to use one or one or the other um, of those you know, techniques. So you're just making the drain can over there is that you know that that's gonna create a little bit of a vortex spiral on the way down, right? Yeah, that's what I was doing a second ago. It looks like now I'm making the uh, the internal drain section. Mm -hmm. So I'm currently working on the part that's going to go inside of the base can. Do you ever like measure or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel called out. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. It's just like... Um, I guess I'm pointing out one, like how, how much experience it takes so that you can do this all by sight. And, and it's like, it's not a call out at all. Everyone works differently. Just like we were just talking about. It's, it's a beautiful form of genius actually. <laughs> right. No, I, I do measure a lot of stuff. It's, um, <laughs> it, it, it's just, you know, it depends on what the, what the application is specifically. Again, uh, the, these particular pieces, um, 
I mean, it's, there's really no good way to measure it because you have to calculate the angle. Yeah. And usually what I, you know, like right there is that's, that's me measuring it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, I work the same way. Like, dude, you and I work in like a really similar way. Like, um, you know, sometimes once in a while I'll go in and measure, use the calipers, you know, but like mostly I just eyeball that stuff. And, uh, you know, that's a little bit different than, than how uh, jewelers do it. And so like, I remember watching jewelers as a kid, they're measuring everything. I was like, man, this seems tedious. And yeah, it it's, is. It's tedious, but beautiful, you know? Yeah, it seems like a, a lot more, uh, a lot more work. That's one of the things I'm going through right now with the project that I'm working on. It's like, I don't have time to draw all of the specs for these mm -hmm. things. I've, I've built these two cabinets um, for this project and all steel frame cabinets that I'm going to do glass work and hang glass off of. And, uh, yeah, I just, I didn't have time to spec them. I'm they're They're built already. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's like, it's a, it's, it's almost like a little bit of improvisation, you know, as opposed to like a written, written scene or whatever. Right. It's like you, you know, uh, and, and it's just like jazz or, you know, music is like jamming. It's a little bit more like jamming than like reading music, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, I remind myself, I'm not prototyping for a factory. I'm right. making it, right. So I, I don't, I don't have to make everything exactly to, uh, production standards. I, I, I need to make everything to the taste that looks appealing to my eye and the eye of the, you know, the future collector and consumer. So we're just pulling down this tube a little bit and, you know, I'm finishing up another wig wag. There's probably, we need a couple more, maybe didn't quite have enough. So I'll make a few more wig wags. I remember making these little tiny ones too. I know. And I still even had to make one more and try to match your pattern. Oh, wow. I was still like one tiny one left over like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, all right, eat to sleep. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> we got the, the nice big kiln on the scut kiln. Th those things are great, man. I, I turn that one on when there's guests. Sometimes mostly I use the small one. Just punny this up. I got like a four or five millimeter rod here, maybe a three. And uh, I'm just going to take this off. It's basically like making a, a regular wigwag just really small so you just got to use smaller punnies and be super careful obviously it fell off of something and i'm i picked it back up to connect it to the rod there nice it's gonna put this in the annealing flame for a second and make sure that's all nice and ready and you got this pulled down to pull to pull some of the tubing like the external tubing on the piece huh uh, yeah, this looks like the parts for some of the uptakes and drains and all the uh, external plumbing. I thinking back to like the history of the, these pieces with the water movement really um, as a as a main functional fact, like where it's recycling. Do you remember the beginning of this in the glass pipe industry? You remember who was making these initially? Honestly, I couldn't tell you, but I do remember walking into a shop somewhere in around, I want to say 2010. Yep, that's right. And someone saying, oh, I can't buy those recyclers from you because Scott Deppie won't sell to me anymore. Yeah, well, there's always a lot of, um, you know, the, yeah, I mean, you got in the glass industry. Uh, people are not always super kind and so it's I think it's a really important well, message in, to be kind to people um, in my defense, I didn't know who Scott Deppie was at the time okay. I had I had no idea he's I had a glass blower I had never heard of him but he's super talented and I, and I respect the heck out of his work but you know it, for me I was like oh I, I didn't know who that was but this is my work well it looks too much like scott's work and i'm like okay well thank you i guess that's a compliment <laughs> i think it was sovereignty who first came out with the at least the first ones that i were seeing and that was like 2010 and i think it was sovereignty who was making the very first recyclers they were a different style 
um and then some other people jumped on it and like the the diff the styles kind of developed a little bit the classic recycler style yeah right? yeah i think that was sovereignty and um yeah scott deppy he's a extremely talented glass blower and coin recyclers the internal it was like with a stacked recycler where yeah. it was internalized yeah that was scott deppy yeah and then, and then i came out with one called the granddaddy perk which was an internal recycling perk around the same time too i think there's a video on the youtube channel of that you guys if you want to check it out um and uh you know i would say just be kind you know not everyone's gonna be nice to you along the way and you know be yeah. ready for that and um just know your worth and and be yourself because everyone else is taken you know there's no one else making pieces like you now and there's no one doing things like me and you know just be yourself do your own thing and exactly you know and and scott deppy does his thing well and you don't need to be scott deppy oh dude right N nobody does he does it well yeah um it's uh no it was it was honestly like it was flattering in hindsight to to be compared because i didn't know who he was and i yeah. went and you know researched his work and was like wow that dude's yeah. super talented and that's amazing work so yeah, it was taught a couple of classes at revere glass you guys if there i think there's some archival footage of that on the online school so if you want to check out his work and his uh his project is mothership you guys might know him under that name as well yeah not like they need a plug but <laughs> i know right it's like okay guys <laughs> but you know but but the but the reality is, is that that scott and mothership has played an important role in the industry and it's worth mentioning to people Honestly, who are new. They, they've inspired tons of us that exactly. they're that they're able to uh come together and create the work that they do yeah uh, and and you know build the market for it really has it it, it really creates that for all of us so yeah it's yeah, awesome I'm just finishing up a wigwag here. It's probably pretty late in the middle of the night now. Pyro, Pyro was working late, you guys, and that's cool. Like we can work 24 hours a day in the studio, um, but Pyro was put in hours, you guys, put in hours into this piece. And um, you know, a lot of people say hours equal powers, and I, I think it's definitely, you know, interesting and cool to see like how much technical development between last time Pyro came to the studio and and now. It's like it's a uh, you know, it's a whole nother, whole nother level. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like I've, uh, I've strived to improve my work over the last few years, um, and still constantly, constantly being challenged. And glass is a, a, a medium that will give you infinite challenge. <laughs> and that's a nice way to say it. Yes, glass, glass, as you know, and those of you guys have tried, it can be very frustrating. And um, in the videos that, that I make, it makes everything look kind of easy. Um, you know, that's that's experience and, and the beauty of editing all put together. So, um, you know, don't get frustrated, you guys. You know, keep keep doing it. Remember why you're doing it, that you love it. And, um, you, you know, it's, it's a break from normal society. It gets you in the flow state. Um, if you're doing it right, it's going to keep getting harder. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's, it's true it doesn't really like <coughs> it's it's it gets hard in different ways it gets hard in different ways the stuff that was hard early on seems much easier and then yeah. you give yourself new challenges right <laughs> yeah it's like the goalpost always moves you know it's like once you once you get there you're like oh, okay i did it time time to move the goalpost again you know right right set a new challenge and if yeah. not then you, you we stagnate so exactly. here this is actually speaking of measuring this is a technique that i use to get my uh my midsection donuts close to the same size uh -huh. so there's there's more than one way to make a donut clearly uh -huh. this is not the same way i made donuts on yep. the video yep but similar actually for the way that i would for encalmo donuts but these ones basically you know i separated the tube down to the size uh-huh broke them down into segments with a little bit of a stretch in between and went back in and I'm heating and blowing out almost like Maria's each donut and now cutting them down and separating them into individual pieces. And that's really interesting. That's an interesting technique. It's like, it's like, um, in ceramics, this kind of technique would be, uh, called off the hump. So if you have a large piece of clay and you start pulling individual cups off of it, 
uh, which is very similar to, you know, con conceptually to, to making the donuts on here. It's like you're making one and making one and pulling it off the same piece and using that as a size reference. Right. And at that point, what I just did there was I actually even blew out and blistered the holes for the sides of that donut uh, for the proof for the, the one just previous to the one I'm working on at this moment. And I uh, got it ready to be assembled together back in with this one again. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to finish this donut partially and open holes onto it. And then I'm going to connect the two and then finish both donuts at the same time from a flipped mm -hmm. axis. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a really complicated technique that I developed for stacking, uh, two interconnected sections with uh, two welds at the same time. Yeah. You guys, I mean, you guys who are interested in making recyclers, um, this video has tons of really valuable information on complicated seals and complicated construction. So uh, you, do, you should definitely watch this video more than once to pick up all the details and then go to Revere Glass if you wanna see a more you know raw version of this where things are slowed down a little bit, maybe no voiceover, but you know, you'll be able to see all the techniques. Yeah, here I'm uh, prepping the donut for the, uh, for the stem. So this is gonna be where the the joint connects on the final piece. Yeah. And, uh, this is going to be like the initial point where the smoke comes in before it hits the water. And and there's lip wraps. Like look at look at the detail. Like there's a lip wrap in between those two sections. And so like everything is detailed. Everything is thought out. And the detail is really never ending. I mean, you, you could you could always go further and put in more little tiny detail and it's just about how many hours you want to spend you know <laughs> on the on the particular project exactly i'm yeah i'm yeah <laughs> <laughs> it goes on and on this one i uh, i have a just in general with my work uh over the last few years i have a tendency if i'm gonna put one in calmo and between a certain color and another color if those two colors come together anywhere else on the piece it has to have the same in calmo so yeah. there if we're gonna if we're gonna put a lippy between the the you know ghost and the carmeline well then everywhere that ghost touches carmeline there's gonna be a lippy yeah no it's true <laughs> i mean and that's the consistency i mean that that adds to the beauty of it i mean you guys see see from here and there'll be some glam shots at the end of these videos for you too but like the detail and the organization, I mean, it, it comes through and, and look at look at what was able to be created. So we're, we're reaching the end of, of uh, this first first part of this video. So make sure you guys stay tuned and check it out. And then next time we put a video up, it'll be the second half of this. Um, so we'll put this in the kiln, kind of get this ready and um, we'll start. Yeah. We'll pick it up right here at the at the at the second video. Look at this that, you guys. Look at that seal. Here, dropping the stem in to, this is my diffuser for the bottom uh, can there. So I already have the drain in there and assembled, and then we're going to leave it right there. So just pop it, pop a hole, and then insert it, and then seal around the edge. It's, uh, it's similar to this to this seal that I do for um, the droplet rigs, I think, a little bit. Yeah, there's a few different ways to do it. I've... Uh, you know, I've done these with like a Maria seal uh, already assembled on the, the donut, on the can, the bend, ready to go. Um, it depends on the colors and what I'm doing on the piece. Yep. You know, uh, how I choose to do my assembly. So now I'm just picking out the, uh, the opening and cleaning off any excess glass before I make the attachment. Yeah, you can already see this thing coming together. I mean, even, even I mean, it took a lot of prep work. Obviously, m most of this video is kind of prepping up the components and getting things ready, but you can see it starting to come together. And um, we're super excited to to show you part two. Um, you can see the piece here. You can see what it's going to look like. And uh, we will see you guys in just two weeks with uh, part number two. Oh, yeah, thanks.
Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us for this collaboration. It was an honor and so much fun having Pyro here. Yeah, you guys check out his work, Sir Pyro Glass on Instagram, and make sure you check out part two, which is the second video, and you can check it out. There should be a link here once it's released. I got some questions that you guys have asked. The first question is from John. John is asking why sometimes when he's working, does the glass get foggy and kind of seem a little bit rough on the surface? And there's kind of two answers to that. Most likely what's happening is you're moving the glass while the core is a little hotter than the skin of the glass. What could be happening is called devitrification, and that's when the glass molecular structure changes from an amorphous solid to a crystalline structure. Most likely a way to resolve this is to make sure that when you're moving the glass, it's nice and hot. So make sure that everything is hot, you're not twisting it, and that'll help you keep your glass nice and glossy. Thanks for the question, John. The next question is from 100% Real Neil. All right, man, so what's going on is you're asking me about how I got so many beads on my mandrel without cracking them. The quick and easy answer is, I don't know what I'm doing because I'm not a bead maker and I was just using the ideas of working borosilicate glass without a bead, so I did crack them. Um, it was the Calypso color that we used a, a one or two beads on the necklace. It's a rare color. It's got compatibility issues. It always has cracking issues, but it's such a beautiful color that I wanted to use some of it just for a bead, but I should have put it in the kiln after each Calypso bead. And so I did crack a couple of those, but the green beads, uh, I was able to get so many on the mandrel because I think my heat is really even when I stop. And so that helps it kind of cool down slowly. And then I'm making the next one kind of close to it. So maybe there might be some radiant heat from that flame kind of helping that one cool down uh, a little bit slower as it's moving further away from my hand. I don't have that much experience making beads but it was really fun learning how to do it and I loved working with Diane and uh, yeah try it out. Tag me on Instagram and um, I'd love to check out what you make. All right the next question is from puff.tv. Mr. TV is asking how to find glass blowers locally. I think the best answer for that is actually go online and check out one of the Facebook groups like my group on the torch. There's a bunch of people there from all over the world and you could say, hey, I'm looking for glass blowers in Michigan or California and some people will let you know where they're at and maybe you guys can get together. All right, you guys, thanks for sticking to the end. I have the giveaways from the last video here. The first one is these three mouthpieces. Those are going to JL Munn. Thank you so much for those colloquialisms. I appreciate it, super funny. The next thing that we're giving away is this beautiful collab piece. Obviously, Diane the Queen of Green and I made it together. And this one is going to Tyler Moe. Thank you so much for checking out the videos. We really appreciate the support. Let us know where we can ship this. Just go to the website, revereglass.com, open up the chat in the right-hand corner of any page. Just let us know it's you and we'll ship it off. All right, you guys, make sure you watch the part two of this video and I'll see you really soon. Bye. Look okay for the video? Yep. Um, all right, guys, welcome back. <clears throat> Hold on, hold on guys. You're not quite welcome back yet. We have to close the door. Now, welcome back. And then you get, yeah, that's fine.